much uh, for that kind of introduction. I'm very thankful to be here and thankful to be a part of this uh, very nice conference. Um, as mentioned before, um, I'm going to talk about an in vitro study we did to evaluate whether SARS-CoV-2 can infect donor corneal tissue, which uh, would put our patients at risk for transmission. And uh, these are my financial disclosures. So a brief background, as you all know, COVID-19 is a global pandemic that started in Wuhan, China. It's caused by the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. It uh, to date has caused more than 2.4 million deaths worldwide. And in the US alone, it is responsible for over 500,000 deaths. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 can infect the eye. Um, they uh, may infect the eye. And so the CDC has recommended eye protection for people at risk for exposure and the EBA has issued guidelines to screen out donors at risk for COVID. And this is based on anecdotal as well as um, clinical evidence that SARS-CoV-2 may infect the eye. The evidence for ocular tropism or the ability of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to infect the eye, like I said, range from anecdotal reports to um, other types of lab studies. The clinical evidence mostly comes from anecdotal reports of um, physicians who have come in contact with SARS-CoV-2 infected patients who had full PPE in terms of N95 masks, gowns, gloves, but exposed eyes and subsequently contracted the disease. This uh, was first reported in China. Um, there have also been reports of ocular symptoms being manifested in patients with COVID-19, and uh, this can range from conjunctival hyperemia to conjunctival congestion to um, uh, other types of uh, corneal subepithelial infiltrates. And this has been reported in 0.8% to 32% of COVID-19 patients. Uh, viral RNA has also been detected in tears, conjunctival secretions of COVID-19 patients, um, as Dr. Shazad Mian had mentioned as well. And then ocular tissues also express viral entry factory factors that are necessary for the virus to invade and infect the cells on the surface of the uh, cornea and conjunctiva. And in particular, ACE2 and TMPRSS2 have been identified and reported on. Um, our lab was also uh, one of the groups that published on this. ACE2 in particular binds to the spike protein uh, that is on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then TMPRSS2 is a serine protease that is necessary to cleave the binding and allow entry of the virus after the binding of the spike protein. So these are all critical and the necessary hardware is there on the surface of the eye. What has not been shown to date is actual live viral studies showing that the virus can infect tissues of the eye. And so our lab basically set out to evaluate in vitro whether using live virus we could infect tissues of the eye. And so we wanted to evaluate the infection of conjunctival epithelium, corneal epithelium, and corneal endothelium using live virus. Uh, we also wanted to evaluate the stability of SARS-CoV-2 virus in corneal preservation medium, because in terms of transplantation, if the virus is not stable in the medium, it is possible maybe that we could quarantine infected tissue and we would still be able to use it down the, right, down the road, maybe seven days out or something like that. Uh, so these were the main questions that we sought to evaluate. And uh, to do this, we obtained two strains of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. As you all know, the virus is mutating and there are uh, more and more mutations coming out. At the time that the study was done, we were able to get a hold of the SARS-CoV-2 strain from Hong Kong, which was considered to be very similar to the Wuhan strain, but we actually found a, a small difference. Um, but it was essentially the virus that spread to Hong Kong. And then the strain from Washington State in the US, which is where the outbreak in the US initially started. So we had the Washington State strain and we had the Hong Kong strain. And we established these in varro cells. And varro cells are basically, in virology, they're the kind of cells that you maintain your viral lines in. Varro cells are basically interferon deficient cells. They come from monkey kidneys. And uh, they're basically highly susceptible to viral infections. And basically, people maintain viruses in varro cell cultures. So we established these lines in varro cell cultures just to prove that they were alive, that they're infectious. And then we... Uh, uh, cultured out several primary explant cultures from corneal, limbal, and conjunctival epithelium. And then we inoculated these cultures with the two viral strains at 0 0.5 multiplicity of infection for an hour. So a uh, multiplicity of infection means that we infected with enough viral titer that at least half of the cells had the potential to be infected. And then cells were washed and incubated in serum-free culture media at 37 degrees with 5% CO2. 
48 hours after inoculation, the cells were then fixed in paraformaldehyde, and then the cells were stained. And using immunohistic chemistry, we determined whether they were infected by staining against a uh, nucleocapsid protein. Now, um, a lot of studies will use, uh, will use spike protein. However, nucleocapsid protein is uh, far more immunogenic, and so you get a much stronger signal, and it's more conserved across viral strains. And so since we're using multiple strains, we stained against nucleocapsid protein. So here are the basically control studies proving that we did have live virus. Uh, these are, again, in Vero cells, which are interferon deficient cells. Uh, you can see these cells uh, just stained in DAPI, showing the cell nuclei. And then you can see nucleocapsid and spike protein staining positive in these cells that have been infected by the virus. And you can see the merged image where you can see quite a few of the cells have been infected. Um, and this was an uh, infection that was performed with a multiplicity of 0.5, multiplicity of infection of 0.5. And not exactly half the cells are being infected, but you can see the virus is quite infected. And then this is the Hong Kong strain. The last slide was the Washington strain. So both of the viruses, um, obviously active, live, able to infect cells. Um, and then if you don't infect the Vero cells, obviously you don't see any nucleocapsid or spike protein. And so this was a, just a negative control. So we established that we had the virus, that they were alive, that they could infect the cells and culture. And then we decided to uh, infect the corneal epithelium, conjunctival epithelium, and limbal epithelial cultures that we had. This is actually the summary of results, and I'm going to go through each of these samples individually, but uh, in some of these cases, the uh, cell cultures did not, uh, did not do well several days after we did the explant cultures, and so they're listed as ND, that they weren't actually infected. But everywhere you can see the positive mark, you can see the strain did infect cells within the cultures, and every, where you see a negative mark, the cells were not infected. So obviously, if we didn't infect the cells in the uninfected columns, all of these were negative controls and there was no viral um, infection. For the Washington strain, you can see two out of four of the corneal epithelial cultures were infected for the Hong Kong strain, two out of five. In the conjunctival epithelium, the Hong Kong strain actually infected all six samples, while the Washington strain was able to infect half the samples. And then for limbal epithelium, the Washington strain infected 25% of the samples, while the Hong Kong strain infected 50% of the samples. Overall, it seemed like the Hong Kong strain was a little bit more uh, infectious than the Washington strain. So these are actually what the images look like. So on the left, you have the Hong Kong strain, and on the right, you have the Washington strain, and this is for sample 0927. And basically, you have the cells in culture. These are conjunctival cells, and the uh, the red stain here is nucleocapsid protein, showing where you have cells that have been infected by the virus. And so the Hong Kong strain wasn't able to infect this, um, these conjunctival cells and the Washington strain as well. And then here you can see the uninfected control. And then when you look at the corneal epithelial cells, the Hong Kong isolate really wasn't able to infect uh, anything. And then when you look at the limbal cells, you can see that the Hong Kong strain was able to infect the uh, limbal epithelial cells that were cultured out. Here's another sample here, both conjunctiva were infected by the Hong Kong and Washington strain, uh, uninfected control. And then if you look at the corneal epithelium, the Hong Kong strain wasn't able to infect the corneal epithelium, but the Washington strain was. And then if you look at the limbal cells, none of the strains were able to infect the limbal epithelial cells in this donor. And then this is another donor. Um, we have the conjunctival epithelial cells, and this time only Hong Kong strain was able to infect the conjunctival epithelium. The Washington strain was not able to infect the conjunctival epithelium. In terms of the corneal epithelium, this donor had the reverse. The Hong Kong strain couldn't infect the corneal epithelium, but the Washington strain was able to infect the uh, corneal epithelium. And then un uh, uninfected controls. And then this is another sample, a different donor, 933. The conjunctival cells cultured out here. The Hong Kong strain was effective. The Washington strain was not. And then if we go to the limbal cells, you can see that neither of them were able to infect the cells. And then if you look at the conjunctival epithelium for this donor, this is 36. Both of the donors had infections in their uh, conjunctival epithelium. In the corneal epithelium, only Hong Kong was effective. And in the limbal cells, only the Washington strain was effective. And so you can see that the 
you, see, you can see that there was a wide variety in how the donor tissue reacted to the infections. There was variability in which strains were able to infect and which tissue types were able to be infected. There was no consistency. And so there's obviously donor factors, uh, tissue factors, and also viral strain factors that all affect whether tissue will be infected. And every infection is, is, a, is a probability event. And so it may be that if we did more, more trials that you would see a more consistent pattern with um, the two different strains. But in the samples that we were able to run, we saw a wide variety of um, outcomes. But overall, the reality is that uh, the corneal epithelial and conjunctival epithelial and limbal epithelial cells can all be infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, whether it's the Washington strain or the um, Hong Kong strain. So next, we wanted to look at the infection of actual endothelial cells. And we wanted to look at this in two ways. We wanted to look at endothelial cell cultures, and, and we also wanted to look at um, infections of endothelial cells on actual DSEC lenticules, so actually on, uh, on a graph. So the endo cells were cultured out from uh, selprogen cells that we obtained commercially, and these were inoculated with virus at a 0.5 MOI for an hour. And then we also took DSEC lenticules and flat mounted them in culture wells and then inoculated these at 1.0 MOI for an hour. And we used the Hong Kong strain for these studies because we didn't have a lot of tissue at this time. And the Hong Kong strain was more uh, infective compared to the Washington strain in our previous studies. Uh, the samples were washed and then incubated in culture media at 37 degrees or and 5% CO2. 48 hours post inoculation, the cells were fixed in prayer formaldehyde. And then we stained for nucleocapsid protein to confirm infection in the cells. So here you can see the corneal endothelial cells that were cultured out. Um, neither the Hong Kong nor the Washington virus was able to infect the endothelial cells in culture. And, and remember, these are commercially available cells. So these were not primary cultured from donors. Um, so we were excited about this. We we're like, oh, maybe endo cells are, are somewhat resistant to infection. And maybe we can just safely do DMEC in all the COVID positive donor tissue. Uh, but then when we looked at the DSEC graphs, we found that the virus can, in fact, infect the endothelium. And uh, we tested four different DSEC graphs, and two of them did become infected by the Hong Kong strain of the virus. And here you can see this is the uninfected control. The sort of red gain is really high, so there's some background noise there. But uh, essentially, there's no viral infection here. And then in these two donors, you can see these sort of plaques where the cells are infected by the virus. Um, and this is the Hong Kong strain. Here's a zoomed out view of the DSEC graft. And you can see these uh, viral plaques where the cells have clearly been infected by the virus. So um, unfortunately, it seems like even the endothelium can be infected by the virus. Um, then the last thing we did was we tested the viral stability in Life4C medium. Um, again, one of the things we we're hoping was that the virus would not be stable in Life4C and some sort of a quarantine period could be instituted to allow us to use COVID positive tissue uh, if, and that assumes that the sort of virus after a couple of days dies off and then now you have a, a tissue that's clear to be used. Um, and so to test this, we basically took Life4C and standard CBCs, corneal viewing chambers with and without corneas, and then we inoculated them with the Hong Kong strain of the virus at one times 10 to the fifth TCID 50. And, and TCID 50, by the way, is a measure of viral titer. It's not exactly the same as measuring plaque forming units, but it's about one to 0.7, um, but, but it is a measure of viral titer. Uh, samples were then stored at four degrees Celsius, and then at days 0, 1, 2, 4, 7, and 14, we took small aliquots out of the CVC and we tested them and quantified the viral titers in those little aliquots. And then 48 hours, um, the infected wells were then <coughs> identified again by staining against nucleocapsid protein. So uh, if you look at the virus stability, in Life4C, you can see from the graph on the right that basically the virus is extremely stable in Life4C. So uh, unfortunately, our hope that the virus would not be stable in Life4C and that we could maybe quarantine the tissue for a short period of time and get away with using the tissue uh, did not hold true. So the virus is super happy in Life4C. 
Um, our virologists kind of hypothesize that it's uh, the, some of the chondroitin sulfate or uh, chondroitin sulfate or some of those things that <clears throat> stabilize the membrane, cell membranes in LIPOR C that make the that make the virus super happy. In fact, viruses are often stored in in things like sorbitol and things like that because they they help stabilize um, envelope viruses. So um, you can see that the viral titers from day zero, one, two, four, seven, 14, they go down maybe um, one log unit, which is not uh, a significant drop in viral titer across 14 days. Um, this is extremely stable in life 4 c um, We tested it actually with a cornea in the CBC because cornea tissue, any, any live tissue, the cells can release defensins that may affect viral titers. Uh, additionally, if the cells get infected by the virus and start to actively shed additional virus, then you may see an increase in viral titers. And basically with the cornea and the CVC, we again see a very, very stable level of viral titers across 14 days. Um, in fact, there was almost no drop, not even a single log drop in, in the viral titers across 14 days. So uh, basically the virus is very stable in our, our preservation medium at four degrees Celsius. And, and there's no way a quarantine would, would make positive donor tissue is suddenly usable. Uh, so in conclusion, SARS-CoV-2 can infect corneal, limbal, conjunctival epithelium, and this conveys a risk for transmission um, of disease through the ocular surface. SARS-CoV-2 can also infect corneal endothelium, and this again conveys a risk of transmission with even endothelial keratoplasty. Uh, the infectivity may vary for different viral strains and for different donors, and um, at this point, we don't have enough samples to clearly map out what donors are more likely to be infected or what donors are not. Um, SARS-CoV-2 is very stable in corneal preservation media and cold storage up to 14 days. So there's not really any, any evidence to suggest that quarantine the tissue would be an effective strategy. And obviously further studies are needed to evaluate the impact of donor characteristics on infectivity. So um, as it stands, I think the data from these live viral infections suggests that uh, the ocular tissues can be infected and there is a risk for uh, infected tissue holding that virus out to 14 days in, in storage. And so we do have to be cautious that these uh, transplanted tissues could potentially uh, transmit virus into the recipient. So um, these are my references. Uh, I'm not a virologist, I'm a cornea specialist. So none of this is really possible without a, a really robust team a virologist willing to support us. In fact, all these infectious, infectious studies were done in a biosafety lab level three um, because you can't handle the SARS-CoV-2 virus outside of a BSL-3 lab. Um, so uh, I really, really want to thank my team, Maxim Sharon, Declan Schroeder, and Venkat Krishna um, were the virologists who helped us. Uh, Heidi was the one who did all the immunohistochemistry and Dr. Yuan, who's the director of research at RI Bank, um, also helped spearhead this project. Uh, special thanks to Lions Gift of Sight for providing tissue for us for our research study, and special thanks to the iBank Association of America for funding the research with a uh, pilot grant. Very insightful.